the use of mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clauses in civil rights, employment, consumer, and antitrust cases. Cases in which one party has superior bargaining power and where adhesion contracts are common. I want to be clear. The bill does not prohibit arbitration. If a consumer or a worker or a small business owner wants to take his claim into arbitration, then by all means he or she is free to do so, provided the corporation itself is willing to do so. But if the consumer or worker or small business wants to go to court, he or she will have that option available again. This isn't a radical proposal. The bill just restores the Federal Arbitration Act to its original purpose and scope. Simply put, this is about reopening the courthouse doors to workers, consumers, and small businesses because the courthouse doors never should have been closed in the first place. I'd like to thank Chairman Leahy for inviting me to hold this hearing. I know that this issue is important to him, and I understand that he has a statement which I will submit for the record. Ranking Member Grassley, it's a pleasure to serve in this capacity with you, and would you like to yeah. give any opening remarks? I'm just going to refer to a small part of my statement, put the whole statement in the record. Uh, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, particularly I look forward to testimony explaining what we can expect following the Supreme Court decision in the American Express case, uh, absent class action provisions. Uh, will consumers uh, really lack the ability to have their dispute adjudicated? And also, what direction uh, will we see arbitration clauses move uh, going forward as a result of that decision? In the wake of American Express and ATT mobility cases, I hope the witnesses can separate myth from reality and give us a clear picture of what's next. I'll put the rest of my statement on the record. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator I Hatch. make a short statement. Yes. I, I have to leave, uh, but I wanted to make just a short statement, and I appreciate your graciousness. Mr. Chairman, I wish to, I, I could stay, but I, I'm unable to. I did want to at least briefly stop by to say that this is a very important issue, and to ask if I could submit written questions to the witnesses. Uh, Without objection. These questions emphasize that litigation is the alternative uh, uh, to arbitration. The bill before us would not only prohibit arbitration, but actually terminate arbitration agreements that parties have already entered into. Before taking a dramatic step like that, we must consider whether the alternative of litigation would be even worse in various respects than what critics say about arbitration. Is the case against arbitration so complete and the alternative of litigation so much better than we should prohibit uh, arbitration clauses altogether? I'm very skeptical about the answer, but we want to explore that with the witnesses through the written questions I will submit, and I appreciate uh, answers as quickly as you can. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate You're you welcome, uh, Senator Hatch. I have tremendous respect for you. I just want to just make it clear to everyone that there's no intention here to remove all arbitration clauses, just mandatory pre-dispute arbitration uh, agree, uh, clauses, uh, which are I feel in, ma in so many cases, uh, I understand. A, a clause of adhesion. And uh, that's what today's hearing is about. There is no attempt here to um, ban arbitration at all. And as I said in my opening, um, anybody else want to make an opening statement? Well, then we'll go to uh, our, our first witness. Um, I'd ask that Deputy Assistant Attorney General Leslie Overton. Uh, who is here with us, sitting at the witness table, that the, she uh, stand and uh, take the oath after I introduce her. So stay where you are, because I'm going to introduce you properly. I'm pleased that the Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, is here to see us today, um, Ms. Overton. She has served in her current position since the summer of 2011, following stints as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General and as a partner in Jones, uh, Jones Day's Washington, D.C. office. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Overton has received several awards, 
in recognition of her outstanding legal talents. Uh, she is one of several signatories to the federal government's amicus brief in the Italian Colors case, which we'll be discussing today. And I have invited her here to discuss that brief with the committee. As is customary at the Senate Judiciary Committee, I will begin by administering the oath. So uh, would you mind standing? And uh, do, you, uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give <coughs> The committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Overton, welcome, and uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate your uh, taking the time out from your very busy schedule. Please go ahead with your, with your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Franken, Senator Grassley and distinguished members of the committee, I appreciate this opportunity to share the United States position in its amicus brief in the Supreme Court in American Express versus Italian Colors Restaurant. The United States brief reflects its concern that the effect of the mandatory arbitration agreement in the facts of that case would prevent the respondents, the merchants, from being able to effectively vindicate their rights under the antitrust laws. My written testimony discusses the brief in detail, so I will now provide background and summarize the points the United States made. In Italian colors, the named plaintiffs in a consolidated set of putative class actions were merchants who accept American Express cards. The merchants alleged that Amex violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act by engaging in an unlawful tying arrangement using its market power in corporate and personal charge cards to compel the merchants to accept Amex's credit and debit cards at elevated merchant fee rates. Amex's standard form contract for the merchants governed the relationship. This card agreement required all disputes between the parties to be resolved by arbitration, precluded any right or authority for any claims to be arbitrated on a class action basis, barred multiple merchants' claims from being joined in one arbitration proceeding, did not, prevent, did not permit the prevailing party to shift its costs to the other party, and prohibited disclosure of information obtained in arbitration. The class action complaints were consolidated, and Amex moved to compel arbitration. The federal district court held that the party's dispute fell within the scope of the card agreement's mandatory arbitration clause, granted Amex's motion, and dismissed the suits. The Court of Appeals reversed and remanded. The merchants presented expert evidence demonstrating that they would bear expert fees and expenses of at least several hundred thousand dollars and possibly more than one million. However, the estimated damages for the merchant with the largest volume of Amex transactions amounted to $12,850, the largest recovery only $38,549 when trebled as provided under the antitrust laws. The Court of Appeals accordingly concluded that, quote, the class action waiver in the card acceptance agreement uh, cannot be enforced in this case because to do so would grant American Express de facto immunity from antitrust liability by removing the merchant's only reasonable, reasonably feasible means of recovery, end quote. The United States brief observed that under the Supreme Court's precedents, agreements to arbitrate federal statutory claims are enforceable if, but only if, quote, the prospective litigant effectively may vindicate its statutory cause of action in the arbitral forum, end quote. With the federal, while the Federal Arbitration Act establishes a generally applicable federal policy favoring the creation and enforcement of agreements to arbitrate, the effective vindication rule reconciles this policy with the policies of a wide range of federal statutes that confer substantive rights and authorize private suits by aggrieved persons. The rule allows contracting parties to agree that their disputes will be resolved by an alternative adjudicator while denying enforcement of an arbitration agreement in circumstances where its function would be, in practical effect, a prospective waiver of substantive rights. 
The brief explained that the arbitration agreement in Italian colors effectively precluded the merchants from asserting their antitrust claims by making it prohibitively expensive for them to do so. No rational actor would attempt to bring a claim when a negative recovery is a certainty. Under these circumstances, an order compelling arbitration would preclude the merchants from effectively vindicating their federal claims. The brief lays out the United States' concern that companies could use a combination of class action and joinder prohibitions, confidentiality requirements, and other procedural restrictions to increase the likelihood that a plaintiff's cost of arbitration would exceed the projected recovery. Companies could then require acceptance of such unwieldy uh, procedures as a condition of doing business, getting hired, or purchasing products. That would deprive a range of federal statutes of their intended deterrent and compensatory effect. This concludes my discussion of the United States brief. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Deputy Assistant Attorney General. Um, and thanks again for uh, being here today. The members will now have uh, seven, minute, uh, seven minutes to ask their questions, and I'll, I'll start. Uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Overton, why did the Justice Department decide to get involved in the Italian Colors case uh, lawsuit in, in the first place? What, what was the public's interest here? I, I Thank you for your question. Uh, private antitrust actions are a vital supplement to the government's civil enforcement uh, efforts under the federal uh, competition laws, as, as well as our criminal um, enforcement. They're also an important component of a range of other statutory schemes. And the United States filed its brief because of our concern that the effect of the mandatory arbitration agreement in the facts of this case would prevent the respondents from being able to effectively vindicate their rights under the antitrust laws. And our brief also identifies the United States' substantial interest in ensuring that arbitration agreements are not used in a way to prevent private parties from obtaining relief. Well, can, can you just yes. uh, talk about how Italian, the Italian college decision undermines enforcement of our nation's antitrust <coughs> Uh, of the antitrust laws? The, the concern we expressed in our brief was that, um, it, that the incentives of companies uh, are, uh, could be impacted, that the effective indication rule creates incentives for companies to craft arbitration agreements in a manner that uh, allows realistically for uh, uh, small claims to be brought under um, the federal laws. However, we expressed concern in our brief that absent that safety valve, uh, companies could have incentives to craft arbitration agreements in a manner, in a manner that effectively serves as a prospective waiver of substantive well, rights. It by making it so hard to, uh, to recover, by making it so costly to arbitrate, by having to operate alone, that it, it, you can't effectively vindicate yourself. You can't have effective vindication. And that's what this is all about. This is overturning, that's what Italian Colors is about, overturning the precedent that had been in Mitsubishi about effective vindication, right? We were we uh, we cited in our brief that the effective vindication rule uh, had been recognized in Mitsubishi uh, almost 30 years ago in 1985 and had been reaffirmed by the court since. So uh, uh, Justice Kagan made the same argument in her dissent uh, when she wrote that arbitration could be used to quote block the vindication of meritorious federal claims and insulate wrongdoers from liability. End quote. Um, can you explain how the Italian Colors decision gives, really just gives corporations license to use arbitration clauses to get consumers and workers and businesses to essentially waive their rights? Well, we, uh, we 
the brief lays out our concerns that companies could use a combination of class action and joinder <coughs> prohibitions, confidentiality provision, uh, requirements, and other procedural restrictions to increase the likelihood that a plaintiff's cost of arbitration would exceed its projected recovery and would, uh, would function as a prospective waiver. And uh, prospective waivers are uh, generally presumed to be invalid. So we were concerned about the incentives uh, that could be created. And we noted that the effective vindication rule uh, has uh, created incentives for companies to uh, have plaintiff um, uh, to, to have arbitration procedures that allow plaintiff, plaintiffs to bring civil exactly to, to bring uh, lawsuit now, uh, which is the other, the other people on the other side of this will argue. Well, you know, the government can always step in and to enforce the law. I think that argument is made in, by some of the witnesses here. But in in its brief, the government wrote, you wrote, quote, private actions are a vital supplement to government enforcement, not only under the antitrust laws, but also under a wide range of other federal statutes. Can you just elaborate on this and explain uh, the role that private enforcement plays in this? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, private enforcement under the antitrust laws, as well as under another, uh, a number of other statutes, is a vital supplement to our enforce our government enforcement uh, efforts and uh, the the federal uh, antitrust laws are, uh, as you are aware, they are enforced by the. Department of Justice Antitrust Division, as well as the Federal Trade Commission, but private antitrust suits add to the deterrent value and provide uh, compensation for aggrieved persons. And we noted in our brief that there's a range of other statutes uh, uh, that have a where private enforcement is such a vital supplement to government enforcement. And we provided examples such as the Service Members Civil Relief Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, among others. And we noted in our brief that while claims under such statutes may generate small damages for any particular plaintiff, these statutes offer important protection against practices that are broadly harmful. And we also uh, noted in our brief that such statutes reflect congressional judgment that uh, such private enforcement is an important part of the statutory scheme. Well, that, that brings me to um, sort of the activism of this court. This is another 5-4 decision. And um, this was, can you, you know, can you give the committee an overview of the precedents that established the effective vindication rule? We noted, uh, we noted in our brief that the effective vindication rule was uh, set out in the Mitsubishi case in 1985 and has been reaffirmed uh, a number of times since. Uh, it seems to me that in this case, the Roberts Court once again went out of its way to overturn precedent in a way that actually benefits large corporations over consumers and, and small businesses and employers, because I'm talking about uh, Italian colors here. I don't want you to comment on that. I just want to note that that's been a concern of mine since I came to the Senate. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, again for your service and for testifying today. I know you've been busy scheduling. I'd like to turn it over to uh, the ranking member. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Overton, for your testimony. Uh, the Department uh, of Justice brief in the American Express noted at least one positive result from the ATT mobility decision. Specifically, companies have modified their agreements, which contain class action waivers, in order to encourage consumers to bring low value claims into arbitration. Uh, such modifications include costs and fee shifting. Uh, page 29 of that department's brief noted that this leaves, quote, consumers better off under their arbitration agreement, end of quote, than they would, or no, continue to quote, than they would have been in class litigation, end of quote. Uh, question, uh, can arbitration be an effective way for individuals to have low value claims adjudicated? 
Thank you for your question, uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, our brief made the point that the effective vindication rule could uh, reconcile uh, the policies in a number of federal statutes uh, that confer substantive rights uh, and authorize private suits. And we uh, noted that the effective vindication rule uh, does uh, create incentives for companies to craft arbitration agreements um, in a manner that uh, allows for low value claims to be brought um, for, for those, for persons to uh, pursue those rights, those federal rights. Uh, we expressed concern in our brief that when an arbitration agreement forecloses uh, a plaintiff from seeking redress for those violations, that the effect of the agreement would not result in arbitration pursuant to those procedures, but would instead cause the plaintiff to abandon the claim. Uh, the department's uh, brief uh, in American Express argued that the mandatory arbitration agreement prevented the plaintiffs from being able to effectively vindicate their rights under the antitrust laws. The brief argued that the restrictions contained in the arbitration agreement foreclose alternative mechanisms such as cost sharing. As you know, the court disagreed factually whether American Express agreement prohibited alternative mechanisms like cost sharing. Two questions then. Uh, does the department agree with a point both the majority and the dissent made in the American Express case specifically that a class action isn't the only way to vindicate claims. In other words, alternatives such as cost sharing can be effective. Senator, in our brief, we identified uh, a number of mechanisms that in the context of that case might have been used by the plaintiffs to pursue their small claims, but those, uh, our brief notes that uh, those options were foreclosed uh, to the plaintiffs, but we identified uh, a number of options. Um, and the card agreement in that case prohibited uh, class action arbitration, um, cost, uh, sh cost sharing, uh, had confidentiality agreements. Um, is it fair to say that at a minimum, arbitration clauses prohibiting class actions must contain some mechanism for sharing or shifting costs? And if that's the case, then the department will agree that a claim can be effectively vindicated. Uh, Sen Senator Grassley, uh, we, we took the position in addressing the specific facts of, that were before us in the case uh, of Italian colors. And in that situation, our concern was that the merchants did not have any opportunity uh, before them. They did not have a realistic ability given the arbitration, the mandatory arbitration agreement and the procedural restrictions in place, they did not have a reasonable ability to uh, pursue their statutory rights because the cost of arbitration would far exceed any recovery they could hope to obtain. Thank you. And just for in case there's any confusion, Italian colors and American Express are the same case. It was American Express v. Italian colors or vice versa. And we'll be hearing from uh, the, the uh, proprietor, the chef and owner of Italian colors uh, in the next panel, uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much, Chairman Franken, for holding this hearing. Um, I have a statement. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put the whole Statement uh, in the record? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, the point that it makes is a, is a, a fairly basic one, um, and it begins with, I think, an uncontroversial proposition that the civil jury as an institution was vitally important to the founding fathers. It was a core casus belli that led to uh, the revolution when the uh, English tried to limit rights to a jury, uh, when the Crown tried to limit rights to a jury. And I think it's also non-controversial that dating back to William Blackstone, one of the functions 
of the jury, the reason that the Founding Fathers put the jury into our system of government as a government institution, just like executive branch, judicial branch, and legislative branch separation, was that it stood as a protection for the individual, not just against the government, but also against wealthy and powerful citizens. Indeed, Blackstone described the civil jury as specifically that, a way for people to be protected from the encroachments of wealthy and powerful citizens. So now in America, the most wealthy and powerful citizens are corporations, big corporations. And if you're a big corporation, you want no part of a jury. You want to go talk to the governor whose campaign you've supported and surrounded by his lobbyists and friends. You want to go to Congress where your lobbyists prowl the hallways, your super PACs influence policy. The idea of standing as a big corporation on equal terms with a regular person in front of a civil jury, it's offensive to them. They don't like it. They fight back very hard. And there's an entire campaign by corporate America to deprecate and degrade the civil jury, and it would astound the Founding Fathers, for whom this was such an important institution and such an important value. And I think it's important that we keep these arbitration agreements in mind in light of that corporate impulse. They would like very much to not ever have to answer to what in the old days would be called 12 good men and true, and now are more like 6 to 12 good men and women and true and uh, the desire to kind of shunt as much as they can into arbitration um, avoids them having to meet the civil jury, dodges that institution of government. And in some cases, I, when I was attorney general, the attorney generals went after one of the main arbitration organizations because filed an action against it because it was so one-sided, so fundamentally crooked that it simply wasn't giving consumers a fair shake. And there are all sorts of problems baked into arbitration in terms of tending to be one-sided, tending to have, you know, people from the corporate world who come in every time and who, uh, it was so bad, I think, and I'm, I'm saying this from memory, so don't hold me to it, but I think it was so bad that the arbitrators would be stricken under the old rule if, the, if somebody objected to them. Well, who's gonna object to an arbitrator? Not somebody who's there once, the person who's going to object is the credit card company that's there day after day after day after day. So by selectively striking arbitrators, they were able to cook up a panel that I think by the time the dust settled, 98% of the decisions went their way. I'm, again, I'm making up that number. But I'm, I'm uh, really glad for all of these reasons that uh, Chairman Franken has brought this issue to light. And my point is there's more here than just an injustice to consumer. There is a real blow to the Constitution and to the constitutional structure that our forefathers fought, bled, and died for. And um, we need to keep that in mind. So thank you very much, Chairman Franken. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ms. Overton, for joining us today. Um, you stated in your written testimony today that um, the basis for the department's position in its amicus brief was that the arbitration agreements at issue in the Amex case violated the effective vindication rule uh, due to the absence of some mechanism for sharing or shifting costs. What do you think such a mechanism might look like if, if, if we were to put something like that in place? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I I'm not in a position, with, with all due respect, I'm not in a position to comment on policy that is the purview of Congress, but I would, I would um, respectfully clarify that in our brief, we noted uh, a variety of um, restrictions, and so the, the contract uh, agreement that between American Express and its merchants required all the disputes to be resolved by arbitration. It precluded any class action adjudication. It barred um, uh, joinder. It didn't allow cost shifting. It didn't allow um, sharing of, of information in an arbitration hearing. We identified several that might have uh, potentially provided an opportunity for the merchants to 
um, reasonably feasibly vindicate their federal claims had they not been foreclosed. We were concerned about the effects of the mandatory arbitration agreement on, in the facts of that case with uh, uh, all of those facts. So is it safe to say that the concerns expressed by the department in the Amex case could perhaps be vindicated by uh, a remedy short of just the wholesale invalidation uh, of these kinds of agreements? It, it, it's theoretically possible at least that you could it, satisfy them by some means other than the wholesale invalidation of, of all such agreements. Again, th thank you, Senator. Again, I, I, I'm not in a position to comment on any policy. I, I can only note, uh, again, what we, okay. what we identified in the brief and in the context of that case, our concerns. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, has, has the U.S. Department of Justice in this administration uh, advocated for the validation of, of um, pre-dispute arbitration agreements generally? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, aware. Uh, I, the administration has not taken a position on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not on, aware. On what? On what kind of reform might be necessary? We, we, I, I, I'm not aware of uh, a position. Again, I'm here uh, testifying about uh, uh, our brief and in the context of. Uh, the antitrust laws and its impact and the concerns we express, but uh, of course uh, we remain happy to work with the Congress on issues. Okay. Uh, but to your knowledge, uh, the Department of Justice has not um, endorsed any currently pending legislation that would limit the effect of these kinds of agreements. I I'm not aware of such a position. No, I'm not aware of such a position, no. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I again want to uh, thank you, Ms. Overton, and uh, I know you have. Oh, I'm sorry, and that bad. That's terrible. I'm awful. In that case. Uh, thank you, Senator Hirono. Excuse me. Very thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The general proposition in um, our country is that people should have the right to access our courts to seek redress and justice. So it is not the norm that all of these matters should be handled through arbitration clauses that basically head off consumers, head off small businesses, head off shareholders, and any other individuals or groups from seeking such redress in the courts. And I think the uh, American Express case Basically, you know, the way I see this case, because it, it, it really goes far in saying these kinds of arbitration clauses are, are okay, even so far as to, in effect, preempt federal, in this case, federal antitrust law. Isn't that what, it, what, what the court said? A private entity, American Express, can preempt federal law and the provisions in the federal law that allowed the small business person to seek redress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the concerns that we expressed in our brief were that under the circumstances of that case, the merchants could not uh, uh, advocate uh, they could not pursue their rights under the federal antitrust laws because the cost of doing so, given the mandatory arbitration agreement and other restrictions, uh, would uh, have been prohibitively expensive. It would have far exceeded the recovery that uh, they could they could hope for. So in and the, the so Supreme in Court effect, did, did not adopt our position. So in effect, uh, with this kind of a ruling, private entities can trump federal law, and you mentioned some other federal laws where there's a, uh, a private cause of action, alternatives uh, that an individual or aggrieved parties could pursue. So uh, you mentioned several examples of how other kinds of clauses could be put into arbitration uh, clauses that would make it pretty tough for anyone to seek redress in our courts, which is, you know, the the general proposition in our country, but for decisions like this, which, by the way, interpreted federal law. So um, since there is no constitutional right to arbitration, it, is, uh, it behooves our committee and the Congress to look at what's going on and making sure that there's a balance here. 
I'm not against arbitration clauses per se, but when they go this far basically to trump federal law, I think that we need to address the situation. That wasn't a question. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Hirono, and that's exactly why we're here today and what we're talking about today in, in American Express v. Italian Colors, basically what I believe we saw was the court overturn precedent of uh, effective vindication, which is that, um, w that in these mandatory arbitration clauses when a um, and plaintiff was absolutely by definition of the circumstances unable to recoup anywhere near their expenses because they are prohibited from joining with other other uh, plaintiffs or they were uh, prevented from a class action where the expenses, they prove the expenses were going to be a, so much more than anything they recoup so it would become irrational to actually go into, uh, to, 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 uh, to go into arbitration that there was no effective recourse, no effective vindication and that's what this was. It was an overturning of a precedent and we as Congress can do something about that and that's what our discussion is about here today. I want to thank you for your testimony and um, you're now dis uh, the witness is now dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I would, uh, I, and again, I apologize, Senator Rono. I really do. I, um, I'd like to invite the witnesses on our second panel to come forward. Uh, and stay, uh, I guess, standing because we're going to administer the oath as is customary. Um, okay, uh, do, uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, welcome to uh, each of you. Uh, our, I'll introduce the witnesses, all of them, and then uh, Mr. Carlson will begin his Testimony. Our first witness is Alan Carlson, the owner of Italian Colors Restaurant in Oakland, California. Mr. Carlson has been in the restaurant business since he was a teenager when he washed dishes at a diner. He graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in 1979 and then traveled across the country working with chefs. Today, Mr. Carlson is not only an outstanding chef, he's also a successful businessman operating several restaurants in the Bay Area. Our next witness is Professor Miriam Gillis from Cardozo Law School. Before joining the faculty at Cardozo, Professor Gillis taught at Princeton and at the University of Virginia. Professor Gillis has written and spoken extensively on the Federal Arbitration Act and access to justice. Our next witness is Vildon Teske. Ms. Teske is a, a partner at Crowder Teske Katz and Miko, LLP, a Minneapolis-based law firm where she represents uh, consumers and uh, service members. In addition to her duties at the firm, Ms. Teske um, also serves on the steering committee of the National Association of Consumer Advocates Military Consumer Justice Project. Earlier, earlier this year, Ms. Teske received the Federal Bar Association's Robin J. Spalter Outstanding Achievement Award and recognition of her tireless and effective advocacy uh, for consumers. Our next witness is Archis Parashurami, the head of the consumer litigation and class actions practice at Mayor Brown. Mr. Parashurami is the co-editor of Class Defense, a blog about key issues affecting class action law and policy. He represented uh, AT&T in the Concepcion case and he has received numerous awards for his work. Our final witness is Professor Peter Rutledge, an Associate Dean and the Hermage, Herman E. Talmadge, uh, Professor of, uh, at the uh, University of Georgia. Professor Rutledge has authored several books and academic articles on arbitration, and he has testified before Congress on arbitration issues before. 
He also was selected to participate in the American Arbitration Association's delegation to the United Nations Working Group on Arbitration. I'd like to ask uh, each of you to give uh, five minutes of testimony to make your opening statements. Uh, your complete written testimony will be included in the record. Mr. Carlton, we, we will, uh, Carlson, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chairman Franken, um, distinguished committee members. My name is Alan Carlson. I'm the chef owner of Italian Colors Restaurant, a small uh, business located in uh, Oakland, California. I was born in the uh, suburban region of Detroit and have been working in, in the restaurant business one way or another since I was 14 years old. Um, 20 years ago, I opened Italian Colors Restaurant with my wife, Diane Cohen Carlson, and business partner, uh, Stephen Montgomery. I'm incredibly proud to say that two decades later, we are still open, serving our community and employing more than 30 people. Uh, like most restaurants, our profit margins are razor thin. We survive by fostering client loyalty, keeping prices low, uh, cooking quality food, giving great service. Uh, we also operate in a credit card driven world and could not survive without accepting credit cards as payment. To customers, one form of payment is good as another, but for small businesses, that is far from reality. Um, so a significant percentage of our earnings come from customers who use American Express cards. American Express imposes special rules on small businesses who must accept their card as payment. For example, in order to accept any American Express card, my restaurant has accept all types of American Express cards, even cards that carry rates and fees that are higher than other forms of payment. American Express also does not allow me to offer cash discounts or to encourage customers to pay with a form of payment that actually works better for my business. I cannot encourage my customers to pay in cash or offer discounts or other incentives. If I could offer discounts to my customers or be able to say which cards make sense for me to accept without being forced to accept all cards, I would increase my earnings and be able to hire more employees. Being forced to make a decision that is bad for my business just isn't right. After describing my situation to my friend and longtime customer and attorney, Edward Zussman, I learned American Express may be violating our country's antitrust laws. When I started with American Express in the early 90s, my first agreement did not have an arbitration clause. To this day, I have not actually seen an arbitration agreement. But I have been told by my attorney, Edward, that one was included in their contracts in the late 90s. Edward explained that forced arbitration means that American Express cannot be held accountable in court and that I will not be able to join with other small business owners to help defray the cost of enforcing our rights. Instead, if I want to hold American Express accountable, I'd have to do it in an individual private arbitration designed by American Express. Uh, needless to say, I was shocked. And even if I knew the clause was in the fine print of the contract, American Express contracts are offered on a take it or leave it basis. Um, as we figured out how to move forward, we discovered that the cost of individual forced arbitration was so high that even if a small business won, it would lose. Um, An ex expert economist explained that it would be most not to be cost effective for any small business owner in the same situation to pursue an individual arbitration claim against American Express. In fact, it would cost more to bring their claim than they could recover. In short, if I cannot be part of a class action to enforce my rights against American Express, I have no way of enforcing those rights. I don't have the money to take on American Express by myself. So you can imagine my disappointment and shock when the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision in favor of American Express and forced arbitration. Essentially, the court said it didn't matter that a small businessman couldn't pursue important rights against a big business. Coming here today to testify before the committee was difficult because I just opened a new restaurant six weeks ago. And um, reflecting on it, I realized how important it was for me to be here, speak on behalf of all small business owners who are struggling to stay in business and live the American dream. Uh, this does not have to be the end of the story. Congress can act to help protect small business across America ensure we have the same access to the justice system as large corporations. Senator Franken's Arbitration Fairness Act would restore the rights of small businesses like mine to enforce our rights. Small businesses are the lifeblood of America, and we play an essential role in creating good jobs. Small businesses, our customers, and really our neighborhoods and communities are the ones who lose when large corporations get to push us around. Everyone in D.C. says that small businesses are important. And here's the real opportunity for Congress to actually do something to protect us. Thank you for taking time to listen to me today, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you for making the trip all the way from Oakland, and uh, good luck on the new restaurant. Uh, Professor Gillis, please. 
Chairman Franken, uh, other distinguished members of the Senate, thank you so much for inviting me here today to talk about this issue um, that I've spent a lot of time over the past eight years thinking and writing about uh, forced arbitration clauses which mandate one-on-one uh, -on -one arbitration of all legal disputes and ban multiple claimants from pooling their claims. That's what we're talking about today. These arbitration clauses, which we can now find in just about every kind of contract you can imagine, um, prevent consumers, workers, and small businesses from vindicating the rights that are guaranteed to them by the common law and by federal and state law. And they immunize companies from accountability for widely dispersed small dollar injuries that they could inflict on people who have no choice, no voice, no bargaining power in the market. For a long time, state and federal judges, Democrats and Republicans, in courts all around the country regularly struck down these arbitration clauses as unfair. Um, finding them uh, against public policy where they prevented people from actually vindicating the rights that legislatures have given them. But all of that changed in 2011 with the AT&T decision that we've already talked about. Uh, and it's only gotten worse uh, this past term with American Express versus Italian Colors because the court there just broadly upheld uh, the use of a remedy stripping arbitration clause, rendering it really beyond legal challenge. Uh, it simply doesn't matter, as Justice Scalia wrote for the majority in Italian Colors, I'm sorry, in Concepcion, uh, that countless cases will slip through the legal system. It doesn't matter. All that matters for this very slim majority of the Supreme Court is that a 1925 statute is, uh, is, is followed, that arbitration clauses are enforced exactly as companies have written them up. Uh, as Justice Kagan wrote in her blistering dissent in the American Express case, the majority's response to the public policy implications of enforcing these remedy stripping arbitration clauses, uh, the reality that no rational individual, uh, small business owner, consumer, employee will ever seek to arbitrate one-on-one -on -one claims against massive and well-funded corporation, the majority's response to that real, uh, imp that real world implication is simply too darn bad too darn bad. So Congress enacted a remedial statute that gives you rights, but you can't vindicate those rights. Too darn bad. That's basically the majority's response. Um, sorry. Now, too darn, too darn bad might be a perfectly fine response for the Supreme Court when it's applying legal rules, um, but this body is doing policy. And so too darn bad just can't be this body's response to, uh, to this decision. I think this body, this Congress, has already recognized the public policy implications of this debate. Congress has tried to outlaw mandatory arbitration clauses in payday loan and consumer credit contracts with military families and in residential mortgage agreements. If these groups deserve protection from mandatory forced arbitration, so do all consumers and employees. Um, and I think the Supreme Court's decisions pretty much squarely put this issue here before you, before this body. The court has repeatedly made clear they will rigorously enforce these remedy stripping terms that companies insert into their arbitration clauses, never mind the consequences unless the FAA is overridden by you, by Congress. So the time is now, and honestly I can't think of a better time because these arbitration clauses are proliferating far beyond what any of us could have imagined just a few years ago. The CFPB arbitration study, which was just released last Wednesday, makes clear that these clauses have become standard and credit card company contracts, checking account contracts, payday lenders use them. And those are just the groups that the CFPB studied. I mean, we're seeing these contracts in all sorts of other uh, agreements with insurance companies, airlines, landlords, gyms, rental car companies, parking facilities, schools, camps, shippers, even HMOs and nursing homes regularly use these contracts. In fact, the nursing home industry is very straightforward about the fact that they all use mandatory forced arbitration in their contracts. Uh, basically making it, uh, making it impossible for individuals to bring individual claims in court or to band together to hold them responsible for systemic harms. I think these remedy stripping clauses are affecting everyone. All of us in this room uh, are, are bound by one or more arbitration clauses that we may or may not know anything about. I want to tell you about one case. It's in my written testimony, but uh, I wanted to just highlight it for you. There's a young Florida man named Kevin Ferguson who enrolled in a medical assistance program in Miami, Florida, just trying to make his life better, trying to increase his opportunities of get, for getting a job. And he takes this, uh, he, he enrolls in this course, it's offered by one of these for-profit educational groups, promising him the, the sun and moon and stars, but of course, 
uh, misrepresented just about everything about the educational program, everything from their graduates' employment statistics to the ability to get financial aid to the actual quality of the program. Uh, Kevin enrolls. He does really, really well. He graduates with great grades but finds himself unable to get a job. Now he does some more investigation and he talks to more graduates and he realizes lots of people feel that they've been duped by this for-profit educational uh, organization and they've, they've engaged in some pretty fraudulent uh, recruitment practices over the years. Kevin brings a claim, but get this, Kevin isn't just suing for damages. Kevin is bringing what we call a true private attorney general claim. He wants to bring a claim to have a, a court, a public court, declare that this educational group has been lying. They've been falsely advertising graduation, graduation statistics. They've been defrauding the public. He wants an injunction and he wants some order stopping this group from continuing to engage in this horrible practice. But Kevin's enrollment contract had an arbitration clause in it. So the district court, faced with the uh, defendant's inevitable motion to compel arbitration to drag Kevin's claims out of the public court and into the private sequestered universe of arbitration, the district court said, whoa, 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 this is a public injunctive claim. So Kevin can't arbitrate this claim, right? This claim belongs in a public court. Denied the motion to compel arbitration. But then Concepcion and American Express were decided. And on appeal, the Ninth Circuit felt its hands were tied and it reversed the district court. So now, you know, Kevin can't get justice, but Kevin also can't prevent injustice to others. Um, and so I think this is a really Professor, serious Professor, problem. Professor, you're gonna have to wrap, wrap up. up. Yeah. I am, I had one paragraph left. Okay. So that's just one of many examples. Forced arbitration is literally foreclosing millions of Americans from vindicating their rights. And as the remedial statutes enacted by this body and by the legislatures of the 50 states are thwarted, I think too darn bad is just not gonna cut it. So I urge this body and this Congress to enact the Arbitration Fairness Act. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I noticed you used air quotes on for-profit. The air quotes don't belong around the for-profit. Educational. Yeah. <laughs> they are You're right. Sorry. definitely for-profit. Um, uh, Ms. Teske. Good afternoon, Chairman Franken, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I will share with you my perspective as an advocate representing consumers and service members in individual and class action cases. As a result of the recent Supreme Court decisions in Concepcion and Italian Colors, many of my clients are no longer able to bring their claims in a court of law using our country's judicial system because of forced arbitration. In my practice, I have had the privilege of representing our brave military men and women in matters dealing with consumer financial issues. Congress provided important, very strong protections for our service members and their families through a federal law known as the Service Member Civil Relief Act, or SCRA. The explicit purpose of the law was to enable our service members, quote, to devote their entire energy to the defense needs of the nation, end quote. With the large number of deployments over the past decade, the financial crisis our country has experienced in the last six years, and the reckless business practices violating service member rights, unfortunately, SCRA claims have been more common than in previous years. My colleagues and I have brought several SCRA cases as class actions on behalf of uh, other, a number of service members. These service members' rights were violated by the same creditor in the same way. In the past, we were able to recover millions of dollars for thousands of service members who were able to join together to hold corporations accountable for violating their rights. Many of the hundreds of military class members that we have spoken with didn't know their rights. The few that knew that their creditor was likely breaking the law didn't have the time to pursue the claim or the resources to hire an attorney to take the case on. Unfortunately, such cases on behalf of classes of service members are now almost impossible to bring due to the Supreme Court's decisions because of a, of a number of underlying contracts out there that have forced arbitration clauses. 
Consider my recent case representing a service member whose mortgage lender foreclosed on his home while he was on active duty serving our country. The lender held a share of sale and sold our client's home in Minnesota while he was being deployed to Iraq in violation of the SCRA requirements. Some months later, he learned he lost his home, but at the time, he didn't know he was protected by federal law from this unlawful foreclosure. While investigating the facts of his case, we found a report that said that a review of a sample of foreclosures conducted by this same national lender revealed a number of other service members that were subject to the protections of the SCRA. So our client made the decision to file his case as a uh, class action and as a representative of all the other service members to get justice for himself and the others. Much to our client's surprise, the lender brought a motion to take the case out of our judicial system and force him to arbitrate. It turned out that in the thick stack of documents at the time of his closing, years before, there was a forced arbitration clause with a class action ban. Based on the Supreme Court's rulings on arbitration clauses, he lost his right to his day in court, the ability to represent the military brothers and sisters, um, and his constitutionally guaranteed right to present the facts to a jury. One cannot escape the irony that while he was serving our country and protecting our freedoms, he had lost his freedoms and rights under our Constitution. It's not sound public policy to require our armed forces members to submit to individual arbitrations that take time away from their service to our country and from their families in order to vindicate their rights. Yet, this is exactly what has to happen when there is a class action ban in a consumer contract. Or, more likely, what would happen is that the service member has to forego vindicating his rights altogether, and the wrongdoer is not brought to justice. In fact, a 2006 Department of Defense report to Congress came to the same conclusion. In my practice, I have seen time and again how forced arbitration harms the lives of American families and our nation's service members. Another example is a case in California against a national lender that repossessed active duty service members' vehicles without court order in direct violation of the SCRA. The National Guard sergeant was deployed to Iraq and when his, excuse me, he was in Iraq when his car was repossessed. Even after the military legal assistance office sent a letter to this lender and asked them to return the car, the lender refused. So he brought a class action on his behalf and on behalf of all the other service members that this had happened to. But one can guess what happened next. There was a forced arbitration clause and there could be no class action. This, of course, meant that hundreds if not thousands of other service members um, had their rights violated potentially, but they were left unprotected and the company got away with breaking the law. Unfortunately, with the proliferation of uh, forced arbitration clauses, these scenarios will continue to play out as for service members as well as all other consumers. Our service members deserve better. Our American consumers deserve better. So do the employees, the investors, the small businesses, and seniors deserve better. They need access to justice in our public court system. Thank you for having me testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Teske and uh, Mr. Parasharami. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Archis Parasharami, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown uh, LLP, where I'm co-chair of the Consumer Litigation and Class Actions Practice. I want to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today, and I thank the chairman for making my uh, written, more extensive written statement part of the record. My legal practice involves uh, defending businesses against class action lawsuits in courts around the country. And in addition, I counsel businesses on adopting fair arbitration programs, and I represent them in litigating over the enforceability of those arbitration programs. So I have firsthand experience with how arbitration agreements work and also how class actions function in reality. 
Based on that experience, my view is that arbitration provides consumers and employees with a fair and accessible way of resolving their disputes, and it does so more effectively than litigation in court. Those benefits of arbitration, in my view, are the primary reason why the Arbitration Fairness Act should not be adopted. Despite its title, the bill would effectively eliminate any realistic access to arbitration for consumers and employees with modest size claims. And for the ordinary consumer employee, the elimination of arbitration will do more harm than good. What does the evidence show? Empirical studies have repeatedly demonstrated that arbitration is at least as likely, if not more so, to bring than litigation in court to bring uh, benefits uh, and more positive outcomes for consumers and employees. It's also more user friendly than litigating in court. Access to this fair, inexpensive, and simple system of dispute resolution is a significant benefit for consumers and employees. Now, perhaps the most common objection to arbitration, and, and I think we've heard it uh, from some of my uh, uh, colleagues uh, today, is that arbitration typically takes place on an individual basis instead of through class actions. But these objections to arbitration rest on inaccurate theoretical assumptions about how this uh, alternative of class actions actually function. And in reality, the bulk of class actions do not provide benefits for the vast majority of consumers and employees. My firm recently conducted an empirical study of 148 class actions involving employee class actions and consumer class actions filed in federal court. And that's attached to my written testimony as uh, Exhibit A. Here's what we learned from that study. Most of these class actions were dismissed either by the courts or voluntarily by the named plaintiff who had sought to represent the, uh, the class. Of the remainder, the relatively few cases that did settle, the available evidence about the distribution of benefits from those class actions showed that usually class actions resulted in little to no benefit to employee and consumer class members. In other words, class actions are not particularly effective at delivering relief. And I think that most people who have received a class action notice or a $2 check in the mail have had that experience, that they simply have not gotten a lot out of the class action uh, of which they were a member. By contrast, arbitration does afford consumers and employees an opportunity to pursue their claims effectively on an individual basis. We, we were lucky enough to have the Assistant Attorney General testify before, and I think that her testimony about uh, the government's brief was illuminating, uh, and uh, Justice Kagan's dissent in the American Express versus Italian Colors case really tracked the government's uh, arguments. And what, the, what Justice Kagan concluded while disagreeing with the majority was that still non-class options abound for pursuing uh, claims in arbitration, pursuing federal uh, antitrust claims in arbitration. In addition, arbitration agreements are increasingly becoming uh, more favorable to individual consumers and employees. More and more companies are paying either all or most of the costs of arbitration. Often, a consumer or employee pays nothing to arbitrate. Companies routinely select the nonprofit American Arbitration Association to serve as the arbitration administrator. And the AAA has set up due process mechanisms to ensure that impartial, unbiased arbitrators serve as, serve, uh, as, as the arbitrators and the neutral decision makers, and that arbitration procedures are simple and easy to use. We're now seeing increasing numbers of consumers that were, uh, and employees that are making use of arbitration. The chairman was kind enough to mention an article that I, I wrote in the, at the start of the hearing. And one thing that I'd like to mention is that that article urges companies, in order to have enforceable arbitration agreements, to adopt arbitration agreements that are consumer friendly, to adopt arbitration agreements that follow the model of the uh, arbitration agreement considered in Concepcion, which the court described as leaving consumers arguably better off than they would be in class actions. Uh, now, especially given these developments, in my view, the elimination of arbitration would be bad for individual consumers and employees as well as businesses. Consumers and employees would be far worse off from losing the ability to pursue claims that they would have that are small and individualized, claims that couldn't be pursued in class action and can't practically be uh, pursued in court because lawyers simply won't take those cases. The primary beneficiaries of eliminating arbitration would be lawyers, uh, lawyers on the plaintiff's side, but also defense lawyers like me uh, who receive large legal fees for defending companies in class actions. In short, the only clear winners of an increase in class action litigation and the elimination of arbitration are, are the lawyers. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before the committee, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rutledge. Chairman Franken, Senator Hirono, Senator Lee, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today 
And thank you, Chairman Franken, for making my entire written statement part of the record. In an abundance of caution, just to repeat one statement from that written remark, uh, the views here expressed today are my own. One of my co-authors is a consultant to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and it's important to me that everything that I say today be imputed only to me and not directly to him or indirectly to the CFPB. With my written statement part of the record, let me make two brief points in the time that you've given me. First, I wish to thank you and your fellow lawmakers for shifting the terms of the debate over arbitration away from legislation by anecdote and toward policymaking grounded in sound empirical evidence. Earlier iterations of this debate risked reacting to particular cases, irrespective of whether those cases were representative of the system as a whole, and irrespective of whether the reforms truly benefited those whom they were designed to protect. Now the debate is firmly anchored in empirical research and should remain so. Just as an example, Chairman Franken, as you know from the 2011 hearing, one important contribution to that debate was the Cyril study, with which you're quite familiar. That found, among other things, that the consumer win rate in arbitration was over 50 percent, that the disposition time from filing to conclusion of the arbitration was six months, a fraction of what it would be in our system of civil litigation, and that prevailing consumers who sought attorney's fees received them over 60 percent of the time. And to Senator Lee's question earlier, I would draw your attention to an initiative the State Department's been involved in with the Organization for American States, which is looking at the question of how to resolve cross-border disputes between consumers and businesses. And one of the proposals that's being considered by OAS at the suggestion of the United States is consumer arbitration. So the record is there. It's certainly not complete. My second point, consistent with my first observation, is to approach with caution claims that in a flight to arbitration will follow a particular Supreme Court decision. Empirical research that I and others have undertaken does not validate those predictions. To elaborate, in working with your staffs, Chairman Franken and others, they asked me to speak and I've appended to my testimony a recent article that I co-authored with Professor Derhosel entitled Sticky Arbitration Clauses where we tracked in the franchise industry the extent to which there was a flight to arbitration after the Concepcion decision. And what we found was that there was not. Depending on the relevant metric, the use of arbitration clauses shifted from approximately 40% to 45% or from 62% to 63%. And the recent preliminary results by the CFPB echo our findings. You've referred to them already, Chairman Franken, and that is 17% of institutions issuing credit cards are using arbitration clauses, and 3% of credit unions are doing so. Now, I acknowledge what we're about to talk about, Chairman Franken, is that part of the reason why that figure is currently low is because there was a period of time where a certain number of issuers refrained in using those arbitration clauses as pursuant to a terms of settlement that is about to expire. And I would recognize, too, that if that settlement were to go away, the number of issuers would go up. However, credit unions would continue not to use them. Now, it's important, of course, to have an apples to apples discussion. Because in addition, we can't simply look at the use of arbitration clauses with respect to issuers. We can also look to it with respect to the amount of credit card debt. And perhaps we can elaborate on that in the hearing. The last point I wish to make Chairman Franken is this. In my view, the flight to arbitration, often predict predicted in connection with the Supreme Court decisions, including Concepcion, has not come to pass. While it is simply too early to predict the effect of the Italian colors case, given the recency of the decision, the historical disconnect between the rhetoric and the reality that Senator Grassley referred to earlier counsels caution. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, Chairman Franken. I'd be happy to answer your and any other committee members' questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Mr. Carlson, thanks for being here and for sharing your story with the committee. I just want to be clear about something you mentioned in your opening statement. Did you have a choice to opt out of the arbitration clause that American Express had you sign? No, I did not. I, I've never signed anything with American Express. 
And did you have any say when it came to the rules of the arbitration? Uh, no, I, I did not. And then the Supreme Court concluded that you had no right to go to court, that you had no choice but to abide by the arbitration agreement, no say over the arbitration procedures, and no right to go to court. Correct? So, yes. so what, what did you do when the Supreme Court ruled against you? Business is, is normal, but, um, you know, I was saddened by it, but there was nothing You I withdrew could do. the case. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The case. Correct. Okay. All right? Right. Okay. Correct. And then when you say you never, I, I noticed in your testimony, you never saw, so you, you had been working with American Express, and they put this mandatory arbitration agreement in the contract like 10 years into your, into your contract. Correct. And did they tell you they were doing that? Uh, no, they never told me anything. Yeah. Okay. So you never had a chance <laughs> to hear your claims heard, either in arbitration or in court. How would things have been different if you had the option to go to court, do you believe? I think we could have gotten a uh, group of other restaurateurs that are as unhappy with the situation as I am and gotten a class action together. Okay, well, that, that's what this is all about to me, is just having access to justice. I mean, basically in this, I, I you know, uh, Justice Scalia said that it didn't matter that you weren't able to vindicate your claims. That just, but the most you would have gotten is about triple the damages to you, which would have been 30000 but you had to individually arbitrate, which would you prove would have cost you hundreds of thousands or maybe even a million dollars, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, well, had my bill been law, you could have cho chosen to go to court where you could have joined forces with other small businesses and your case could have been heard. And maybe this would be different. Ms. Teske. One of the things that I found remarkable in your written testimony, you talked about a little here, was the comparison you made between the way things used to be and the way things are now. Years ago, you were able to recover millions of dollars for service members whose rights had been violated. Today, it seems like it's nearly impossible to bring cases to enforce laws that protect our men and women in uniform. Can you com comment on this? Absolutely. The majority of the consumer financial contracts that the service members have entered into in the last few years, and I assume that will continue in the next few years, have these forced arbitration clauses. We have heard already about the credit card uh, uh, contracts and the variety of other types of contracts like cell phone services or car loan contracts. Uh, whereas before, we might have been able to um, get relief for the class members for violations of the Service Members Civil Relief Act as a class action, in those situations, we are no longer able to. Each service member would have to file their own individual arbitration. They would first of all have to know the intricacies of the Service Members Civil Relief Act and know that there was a violation then file their own individual arbitration, take the time and effort to do that. And they would not be able to bring a representative case to represent the hundreds, if not thousands, of other service members that had the same thing happen to them. So it's night and day um, compared to before forced arbitration clauses and now. Okay, you told one story in your testimony that really illustrates the problem. Uh, I went back and looked at some of the court documents for that case, and frankly, I just think it shocks the conscience. Uh, the Service Members Civil Relief Act says, that among, uh, says, among other things, that banks can't foreclose on service members who are on active duty without first getting permission from a judge. The idea is that we can't expect our troops to uh, fight the enemy abroad while uh, fighting off bank foreclosures or an eviction notice at home. I think we can all agree that that's a good law. Uh, literally, we can all agree this law passed by unanimous consent. <laughs> you testified about a soldier from Minnesota, from my state, who earned several honors during the course of his service, including the Army Commendation Medal. On the same day that this soldier was ordered to report 
for active duty his lender initiated foreclosure proceedings against him. So, the soldier goes off to Iraq to serve his country, and meanwhile, the bank is trying to take his house away from him without first going to a judge for permission. So it's a blatant violation of law. And it gets worse. The lender falsified an affidavit swearing under oath that the bank knew that this man was not in military service, which was completely untrue. Using that false affidavit, the lender got the sheriff to put the soldier's house up for sale, and the house was sold while the owner of the house was in Iraq, at, in Balad, at Camp Anaconda, right? I've been to Camp Anaconda four times. It was called Mortaritaville because I got mortared so much. Guess who ended up buying that house? The lender. The bank. That foreclosed. I mean, I got a heck of a deal. It paid between a, a quarter and a third of the value of the house for the house that it foreclosed on illegally. Great deal for the bank. Not a good deal for our soldier in Balad. Now, my understanding, Ms. Teske, is that the soldier wanted to file a service member's civil Relief Act case to seek justice, not just for himself, but also for other soldiers who had been foreclosed upon by the same bank. And it was really important for him to know that other soldiers knew that they had legal rights and that those rights might have been violated. You mentioned in your testimony that there was some indication that your client wasn't alone, that there might have been other victims out there, so the soldier filed a case for himself and for other soldiers who had been foreclosed upon by this bank. What happened next? He didn't get his day in court. Um, he, because of the forced arbitration clause, the judge uh, went ahead and ordered arbitration, and we ended up settling the case, and he wasn't able to represent the other service members. So. Uh, rather than having a class action that could go forward where others and he could get relief in our public court system, in the public eye, um, none of those things happened. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my time. Uh, I'll, we'll come back. We're going to have a second round for anyone who wants to stick around. But that, to me, is just an outrage. That's an outrage. Um, we will go to uh, Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, Mr. Parsharami, uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. The, the CFPB, in its preliminary findings, notes that it, uh, quote, in, it intends to, quote, assess the possible impact of arbitration clauses on the price of consumer financial products, close quote. Um, I believe you indicated in your written testimony that consumers and employees might well benefit through the systematic reduction of litigation-related transaction costs, which leads to lower prices and higher wages. Um, can you uh, explain uh, for, for us uh, sort of what you mean by that and, uh, and, and where that, that comes from, how you get there? Sure, Senator. So, sorry. So, so uh, Class actions and litigation in court aren't free. They come with a cost, and in fact, massive costs. Uh, the costs of, of litigation are high. The costs of electronic discovery are high. The costs of paying uh, plaintiff's lawyers if the case settles are high. The costs of paying me and my colleagues and other law firms on the defense side to litigate the case, that happens in every case. So there are extraordinary legal costs associated with uh, class actions and litigation in courts. Arbitration is a lot cheaper and uh, quicker and more efficient, so the costs are, are lower. Now, where do these costs go? They, you know, they don't just kind of vanish into the ether. A company that experiences these litigation costs in a competitive market will pass them along 
to consumers uh, or uh, reduce wages for employees or otherwise not hire more workers, uh, these costs are passed along in some form or another. And typically, in, in a consumer context, it's passed along in the form of, uh, if you save co those costs, they're passed along in the form of lower prices. If you can experience those cost savings, they're passed along uh, by, by lowering prices. Um, so, so the point is, is that, uh, and I, let me just say that uh, scholars who have looked at this have said that it's simply a matter of basic economics, that cost savings that come from, uh, from the use of arbitration are passed along in competitive markets to, uh, to consumers. Okay, okay. Um, another thing that you stated in your written testimony was that businesses are unlikely to uh, offer post-dispute arbitration, meaning once the dispute arises, they're not likely to uh, raise that as a possibility. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, why is it that parties are rarely going to be entering into that kind of arrangement? So in the, in the pre-dispute context, pre-dispute arbitration agreements, the ones that would be affected by this uh, proposal, both sides, the consumer or employee and the business, are committing in advance to use arbitration. And so when a company implements an arbitration program, it commits to taking on a ton of incremental costs that it wouldn't bear in court. Under most arbitration agreements, such as the ones that are governed by the American Arbitration Association's consumer rules, uh, a business will have to cover filing fees, these amount in consumer cases to $1,500. And they also agree to pay the arbitrator's compensation in full. And arbitration agreements, like the ones that I advise companies to adopt, uh, often agree that they will pay even more substantial costs. Sometimes they'll pay the full cost of arbitration. Now, businesses agree to take on these uh, high incremental costs because overall, they experience the cost savings uh, from reducing the litigation costs associated with, with uh, class action litigation and litigation in court, the costs we just talked about. Um, and because they save primarily on e-discovery costs and lawyer fees, the lawyers like me and the lawyers like my colleagues on the other side, um, it benefits them to pay all of these incremental costs for an arbitration program. But if you were in a regime where only post-dispute arbitration agreements were permitted, where either side could choose only after the dispute arises, then companies really wouldn't want to have that two-track system because they would have to both pay the costs of maintaining an arbitration program as well as all the costs uh, of, of the maintaining the litigation system in court. And so they simply won't want to pay twice. It won't be realistic. If companies will only uh, are only uh, allowed to have post-dispute arbitration and are required to defend claims in court, they simply won't uh, allow for arbitration. And this would actually be very detrimental to consumers and employees who wouldn't have realistic claims to bring in court because if they can't hire a lawyer because they have a small individualized claim that won't lead to a class action, they're just out of luck. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Mr. Rutledge, in your written testimony, you talk about um, the importance of relying on sound empirical research before proceeding with legislation in this area. Um, what are the risks in, involved in legislating in this area uh, uh, w without an adequate, robust empirical basis for doing so? Thank you for the question, Senator. I would identify two. Uh, the first would be the um, lack of a proper apples-to-apples -apples comparison. So, for example, oftentimes arbitration is criticized, and then the response becomes compared to what? So, for example, one of the frequent dynamics in the debate is that we should not have arbitration and in lieu of it should be class actions. And as I indicate in my testimony, um, a number of individuals have written, um, including my colleague at the University of Georgia, Jamie Dodge, that it's not clear that in the aggregate that the class action apple is superior to the arbitration apple. For example, the settlement that the class action may generate may have a relatively low uh, take rate, which is simply the rate at which the members who are brought into the class uh, actually redeem the benefit. And at the same time, if they don't redeem the benefit, and yet they are bound by the decision of the class, they're effectively precluded from bringing their own claim at that point. Uh, so that would be the first concern. The second concern would be that there may be instances in which the regulation goes on to harm the very individuals whom it's designed to protect. So, uh, as you may be aware, one of the early iterations of incremental legislation that sought to uh, invalidate pre-dispute arbitration agreements concerned contracts between uh, automobile dealers and manufacturers. And uh, many of the arguments that you hear today were raised in that debate. 
It turned out that there was one reported instance after that legislation was enacted where uh, the dealer uh, wanted to arbitrate, uh, and yet the legislation precluded the dealer from doing so. And so those are the two risks that I would draw to your attention in the time that I have. Thank you. Um, you, you, um, you seem to um, not believe that it's certain that we're going to have a flood of uh, uh, arbitral class waivers. Uh, we're not necessarily going to see a mass migration to arbitral class waivers. Um, help us understand what factors influence that thinking. Sure, and, and I think it's important for me to, to clarify um, something in my, my testimony because this is a complex issue. Um, what, what my testimony is suggesting and what I think the CFPB preliminary report indicates uh, at page 19, for example, uh, actually, excuse me, page 21, uh, is that simply because the Supreme Court hands down a decision that seems to approve of a particular type of contracting practice in a given industry, that firms in that industry won't necessarily flock to that practice. In my paper that's attached to the testimony, that's the point we make about franchise contracts, and I think in the CFPB report, again, taking into account the, the settlement that, that um, uh, Senator Franken and I were sort of exchanging over uh, a little while ago, at least at present, for the credit card industry. Now, um, I want to differentiate that from a different situation that I talk about in my testimony, which is the use of class waivers among those entities that do employ arbitration clauses. And here I wish to acknowledge that where the empirics lead us is that both in the franchise context and in the credit card context, for those companies that do use those clauses, that there is an increased incidence in the use of the class waiver. My point is simply this, that the debate uh, often occurs on sort of homogeneous terms, that industries can be sort of compared and that practices of firms within industries can be compared. And what I think this, what the empirical research reveals is that's, that, that's not necessarily true. There are certain industries, to the extent we have access to the data, where this is used more frequently than others. And there are certain firms within given industries where we have access to the data where the use appears more or less likely. And my point simply to you and to your colleagues is to understand the dynamics that are driving those decisions before generalizing from a particular case or a particular firm's activity as to how an industry or how a particular set of firms is behaving. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Lee. Um, I think part of the exchange that we had, which was me smiling at something you said, um, was the, the, the talking about apples to apples. And I thought that when you were talking about um, some of the CFPB um, results, you were uh, not comparing apples to apples, you were talking when you said 17%, only 17% of, well, I'll get to that in, in some questioning. But I think that when we talk about sound empirical research, we should, the, the, the word sound isn't very important. We'll go to Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, Mr. Carlson, I, I'm sorry for your experience, but I'm thank you for coming here to testify and to uh, share your experience with us. Um, it strikes me that if the ability of individual consumers to aggregate their claims is eliminated, and whether that's done by Congress deciding that we're just not going to allow small claims to go forward, or whether that's done by the corporate malefactor sneaking something into a contract, a consumer contract that prevents them from exercising what would otherwise be their legal rights, um, it strikes me that that creates a zone where fraud is encouraged, where it is basically given a free pass. Um, we had, it's interesting that we should be here today because this very morning we had the hearing on the patent troll 
legislation. In that case, in that hearing, the issue was the so-called patent trolls who engage in frivolous litigation and threaten companies. And the argument there is that the cost of litigating with the patent troll makes it irrational to fight back and so people concede to settlements. And there was, the room was filled, everybody was excited about that notion. And here we have legitimate victims of what has somebody has found to be wrongful or fraudulent behavior who try to engage in legitimate litigation to vindicate their rights against the fraudster. And here the cost of litigating um, would make it irrational to fight back. And it's almost the, the flip side. What is, let me ask Professor Gillis, what is your observation about what message corporate America would take from the ability to have no redress for low dollar but large scale frauds that they commit. Let's say that the telephone company figures out a way to put a bogus one dollar charge on every single bill that you make. And by the time you figure it out, you know, maybe for a year they did it so you're owed 12 bucks. They cheat millions of people so they earn millions of dollars. Who's gonna stand up for them when uh, the only possibility of return is 12 bucks back. Thank you for the question, Senator Whitehouse. Um, no one's going to stand up for them. Uh, stand up and, against them. Uh, stand up against them. Yeah. No, one, no one can be the voice of, of the consumer who is, uh, who is uh, subject to a hidden cost, a fee that they don't even notice. Um, you know, whether it's one month in or 12 months in, they don't even notice it. Or, and when they do, it's such, such a small value, uh, such a small amount that it's not worth it to them to, to arbitrate these claims. So, I, so if we allow the corporations themselves it's just to a, it's just a, put these tricks and traps yeah. into their consumer contracts, we're basically giving them open season for low dollar, high volume fraud on consumers. We are. That's exactly what we're doing. It's it's a mandate to violate the law, uh, and uh, it's not and a mandate, a permission. A permission, yeah. right? Um, the Supreme Court's decisions, I think, are, are certainly a mandate. And and I, I do want to respond a little bit to what my colleagues at the end of the table uh, said just a, a, a little bit ago. Uh, Mr. Parashurami noted that um, in response to Senator Lee, that that these the class actions have no value. Uh, right, class actions, right, let's remember everyone that class actions desegregated schools. They made workplaces fair and equal. Um, they, they've prohibited uh, problematic police practices. They have, they have uncovered and detected all sorts of consumer frauds. Class actions have done a tremendous amount of good. And I think that Mr. Parashirami's memo, I wouldn't call it an empirical study because it's just 148 cherry-picked class actions um, that Mayor Brown thinks were, didn't provide enough value to consumers. I, I think that's not a real study. The real study we have uh, is the CFPB report, which really takes a very good look at um, the, uh, the number of arbitration clauses that we're seeing in these, uh, in these agreements. And just again on Professor Rutledge's testimony, um, it's not, first of all, I think that 43 and 63 percent are quite high numbers to, uh, to find in franchise agreements, but setting that aside, the CFPB finds that we are looking at nine out of 10 contracts in the consumer finance uh, area with these forced arbitration clauses, which means that consumers can't bring these claims because these claims are inherently collective claims, right? So when Alan has a problem with the, because he thinks that Amex is charging him too high a rate, um, and he'd like to get together and pool resources with other restaurateurs and small businesses, independent bookstores, hardware stores to bring a claim again in, uh, under the Sherman Act against American Express. The only way he can do that, the only way he can afford a million dollar uh, expert report on antitrust impact and injury is if he's able to bring it as a class. So Amex, by putting this class action ban in their card acceptance agreement is basically ensuring that they will never be held accountable under the Sherman Act. And this is really interesting for Amex, of course, because just last Friday, Judge Gleason in the Southern District uh, approved a, a settlement in a claim against Visa and MasterCard, a class action, for exactly the same behavior. So Visa and MasterCard are paying $7 billion, so that's worthwhile class relief, $7 billion, record settlement. Amex is getting away without anything, because they happen to put some magic words in their arbitration agreement. I think that's very unfair. As somebody who's now spent a term of six years in the Senate and 
begun to observe some of the behavior around here, um, I wonder what the response would be like if um, corporations in consumer contracts down in the fine print in tricks and traps, instead of taking away consumer rights, particularly consumer rights protected by the Seventh Amendment, were, say, taking away gun rights <laughs> protected by the Second Amendment. I think you'd have a completely different story. I and think the room would look like it did this morning, right? It'd be full. It, it, would, it would look <laughs> right? very different, yeah, and yeah. you might actually see different positions taken okay. by the different sides. I think a lot but, depends the, on whose ox is, ox is being gored here. And right but now the truth is consumer. that really there is nothing to keep a corporation from inserting all sorts of remedy stripping terms in its arbitration provisions. The Supreme Court's language. The Supreme Court has announced no limit. No limit. On the what FAA protects everything. It's sacrosanct. So if I'm a corporation, I'm going to put a Go lot of it. stuff in there. Yeah, I'm going to violate Title VII. I'm going to violate the Chairman, ADA. Chairman, my time is uh, Sorry. included. So uh, thank you very much. You're doing so well. Uh, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my. Uh, series of questions really related to uh, the extent of these arbitration <clears throat> clauses because they are, I think, becoming more and more prevalent. And it seems to me that if you are a corporate lawyer or an in-house counsel, that it would be practically malpractice not to advise your clients, uh, your corporate clients, to have these kinds of remedy stripping clauses in their contracts. Would you agree, Ms. Gillis? Absolutely. Um, and I, I, obviously, Mr. Parasharami can speak uh, to this more than I can, but I think I think he, I heard him say he advises yes, he, his clients. Yes, he, he probably and, does. Yes. And, uh, and, and though he tells us that in his testimony that he advises his clients, which are all, you know, Fortune 500 companies, to put fair, consumer-friendly arbitration clauses in their contracts, let's be clear, a class action ban is inherently not consumer friendly because a consumer cannot bring a collective claim when there's a class action waiver. So really it doesn't matter how many cost shifting provisions, how many promises to pay a bounty or premium are put in these arbitration provisions. The truth is Allen's not going to go arbitrate one on one against Amex. It would just be too expensive no matter what the what Amex puts uh, what the company puts in the agreement. So um, so yes, I think at this point uh, the, the next interesting case to watch is the malpractice claim that's brought against a transactional attorney for failure to put one of these in yes. a clause. Mr. Carlson, thank you very much for being here because you've been through a lot in pursuing your claims. Uh, and so um, we did hear testimony that arbitration clauses are good because uh, they save money and these savings are passed on to consumers. But in your case, you wanted to pass on some discounts, et cetera, to your customers at your restaurant, but because of this tying arrangement, which is basically practically a per se antitrust violation, you didn't have those, that, that freedom to do that. So your consumer, your customers suffered for that. Yes. <laughs> was, there, was that a question there? I guess that may, that may have been yeah. a rhetorical question. I have, a, I have another question for Professor Gillis. Uh, the, this bill that we're considering, uh, basically, you know, the, the language says that there is no pre-dispute arbitration agreement shall be valid or enforceable if it requires arbitration of an employment dispute, a consumer dispute, antitrust di dispute, or civil rights dispute. Now, what about shareholder disputes? Do you think that this language covers those kinds of disputes? I do. I think that investors are consumers. Um, and I think that, uh, that there's a lot of support out there for uh, providing investors with uh, the opportunity to uh, go to court as opposed to going to arbitration, so well, I think so. I wouldn't be so sure that consumers could be deemed, um, that, that investors could be deemed uh, consumers. Perhaps we need to make sure, mm -hmm. because I am holding letters from over 200 major domestic and foreign institutional investors who are very concerned that the SEC has not promulgated a rule that would um, not, that would disallow forced arbitration clauses in shareholder disputes. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we need to make that clear because these 200 um, major entities include just about every state's retirement and pension funds. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. We're talking about some 
um, collectively managing assets that exceed $4.9 trillion. And they are concerned that there are these forced arbitration clauses in, um, in their contracts with their brokers or whoever, and mm -hmm. they can't go to court. Well, you know, there, I think you could certainly clarify the language. You know, I think of investors as consumers because when you're talking about these sort of public pension funds, you're talking about firefighters and mm -hmm. teachers and other yes. ordinary folks who yes. look just like a lot of the other consumers that we're talking about today. But I, I applaud the committee uh, committee's effort here. And if you want to go further and be clear that you're also covering con uh, investors, I think that would uh, that would probably save a future court a lot of time. That would certainly make me feel a lot better knowing that uh, there are so many different ways that these arbitration clauses can be written to head people off at the pass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you may have gathered, I think the majority of members of this panel who are here today agree that arbitration sometimes violates basic fairness and sometimes even constitutional rights, but the members of the panel who are not here might not be part of that consensus. And likewise, members of the Senate may not be in agreement that we need to change the law to restrict arbitration, although I have been a longtime advocate of making sure that consumers are protected from arbitration clauses that may not be clear or conspicuous, hidden in the fine print, as one of you observed. Uh, so I think we have political obstacles to overcome here, and not the least of them are the interests of corporations that uh, are loath to go to court to be subjected to claims based on liability for violations of law related to financial practices or product defects or a range of violations of consumer rights. But I think there is one area where there ought to be total and complete consensus, and that is that our servicemen and women should be protected not only in name and rhetoric, but also in reality, which, Ms. Teske, your testimony, I think, uh, powerfully uh, supports. And in fact, uh, regrettably, going back to uh, reports from the Department of Defense and others since then, uh, many servicemen and women have been victims of violations of rights, whether it's in foreclosure of their homes, repossession of vehicles or other personal property protections against judgments, uh, where they may not even have appeared, uh, evictions. The whole idea is that when they are in active duty, they often can't focus on these areas of life, not to mention appear in court or in proceedings preliminary to uh, court proceedings or arbitration proceedings. So I guess my question is whether uh, there is a way to deal very specifically in a focused and targeted way with these violations of basic fairness that you outline in your testimony a targeted way through the Service Member Civil Relief Act or through some other mechanisms to make sure that we're protecting our men and women in uniform? Thank you for that question. I, there is, I mean, certainly there is precedent for that in the Military Lending Act. There are, is a provision that for a narrow set of contracts, you can't have uh, forced arbitration clauses. We could do the same through amendment of the Service Member Civil Relief Act to make clear that they can't be forced into arbitration <laughs> and that they do have the right to bring class actions in a court of law. Um, and I think that would be a, a great step forward, at least for the service members. But one thing that I do want to point out, in addition to that, is that our service members are also consumers and they have a whole host of rights under scores of consumer protection statutes. By amending the Service Member Civil Relief Act, although that's a major step forward, uh, we are still leaving them open to forced arbitration for all the other consumer protection violations that they are victims of. So I would applaud any effort to, um, to 
provide protections, further protections for service members under the Service Member Civil Relief Act, but I think we also cannot forget that the two million men and women that serve in our military are also consumers and their families are consumers and employees. I, I uh, accept and uh, I applaud that comment and I agree completely with it that they ought to be viewed as consumers in those other contexts as well. But I'm thinking about what is achievable strictly in raw political terms because uh, I haven't been here as long as uh, Senator Franken or Senator Whitehouse, but uh, I do know that uh, often we are frustrated in trying to achieve these kinds of reforms. Uh, Mr. Parsharami, I wonder if I could ask you whether you would have the same objections that you've outlined in your testimony to that kind of focused and targeted bar on arbitration for our servicemen and women who may literally physically not have the ability to make use of these arbitration clauses. So I suppose I, I don't think that it's a good idea, and uh, you know I, I should say absolutely I respect our service members. Uh, you know it's it's uh, what they do is so important, and uh, and I, I would not want to take anything away from them. If if the question is how can they realistically achieve uh, resolution of most of the claims that they have, most people have consumer disputes that are small and individualized. Class actions just necessarily can't help them because if a claim is individualized, it can't be brought on a class basis. And so then the question is, well, which is better, going to court or going to arbitration? And it turns out that arbitration is cheaper in many instances because companies pay all of the costs of arbitration and it's more flexible. You don't have to take a day off work. And, I mean, and when you're a service member, you're, a day off work is impossible. You can do it remotely. You can do it by telephone. You can do it uh, by mail. Uh, and in many cases now, uh, email is the preferred form of communication uh, with, uh, with arbitration organizations. So I think it's actually more realistic to resolve claims on an individual basis through arbitration than through court. Uh, what would you say to that, Ms. Teske? Thank you. I've, I've been listening and just kind of shaking my head. Um, the, it's not reality. It's just not reality to say that service members are going to have a better chance going and arbitrating their claims. Uh, we have seen time and again that a very, very small number of consumers and probably a much smaller number of service members are going to go and take their claims to arbitration. What's happening really here is claim suppression. The majority of service members, A, are not going to know their rights under the Service Member Civil Relief Act, and B, they are not going to have the time or the effort um, or the energy to be able to bring these individually. So yes, in some cases, it is appropriate for an individual court action. Um, and if they want to voluntarily to take it to arbitration, I think that's great, but it has to be voluntary. But in many cases, the corporation that is breaking the law, the Service Member Civil Relief Act, is doing it on a widespread basis. It's a corporate practice, or they have not put into place procedures to comply with the SCRA protections. And so in those situations, a class action is the best vehicle to go forward, and we've seen that in cases already. Uh, so to say that, no, we shouldn't have the ability to bring class actions for our service members and that they should be forced into arbitration because that's a better route for them, I think is disingenuous. Thank you. My time has expired. I, I uh, welcome and appreciate all of your testimony. It's been very, very helpful and important, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Blumenthal. I, I have some more questions I would like to ask the panel, and um, so we'll have a second round. Professor Gillis, in, in, in his written testimony, Professor Rutledge argues that we haven't seen an explosion of arbitration clauses and class action waivers in franchise agreements. Then uh, on page 11 of his written testimony, Professor Rutledge says, quote, last week's CFPB report of preliminary results told a similar story in several sectors of the consumer financial services industry, end quote. My reading of the CFPB report was nearly the opposite. And I think this gets to the 
apples and oranges because he was talking about 17% of small of you know of the I guess the companies using or to do this using these contracts but an enormous percentage of the contracts are uh, have the clauses I mean, that actual in actuality so can you speak to I mean What's your take on this? I, my reading was that the report indicates that arbitration agreements and class action bans are extremely prevalent among outstanding credit card loans, insured deposits, and prepaid card, uh, cards. Is this, a, when someone is saying we got to compare apples to apples, isn't it incumbent upon you to do that? And what's your, just what's your take on this? Well, I read the report the way you do. And I say that not just because you're chairing this, uh, this, this hearing. I, I, I read the report, the CFPB report, and it really is the best empirical study we have out there. Um, uh, I read it as saying that basically nine out of 10 uh, companies are using these forced arbitration clauses, that we're seeing almost 100% penetration of class action waivers, uh, class action bans in, uh, inserted in arbitration clauses. And I don't think that Professor Rutledge is, uh, I, I don't think his testimony um, is uh, is accurate on that point. Now he did try to clarify in uh, in his or in his answer to uh, uh, or in his uh, opening statement that that he does agree that we're seeing many more class action uh, bans, and so so maybe we're all on the same page on that, and and that that saves this uh, this testimony. Look, I, I think it would be crazy for a company not to insert uh, an, a class ban in its uh, in its arbitration clauses. I'm sure Mr. Parasharami tells every client to do so because to do so is to ensure, uh, unlike uh, what Mr. Parasharami has, has testified to, that they will actually not have to be held accountable uh, for any violations of law because very few consumers, employees, small businesses will ever bring an arbitration. Um, and certainly there will never be any arbitrations that near the numbers and near the significance of a class action. Um, and furthermore, a the thing about arbitration, let's just be clear about what we're talking about. Arbitrations are private, they're sequestered, they're individual. You can only bring a claim for yourself. So maybe you do bring a claim, maybe Alan does decide to bring a claim, so he, he gets some money back from Amex. But you know, Alan will have no power to actually change Amex's policy vis-a-vis -vis every other card acceptance uh, contract. That's what, that's what class actions do. Well, let's talk about just this, how this affects people's daily lives. We here we have a restaurant, guy who went to culinary school, moves out west, opens a number, a uh, restaurant, is, has a few in Oakland. I want to, if I get out to Oakland, I'm going to Italian colors. <laughs> uh, because it's been successful a long time and all the food's good there. Okay, that, that, that's how he's affected by this, is that he can't pass on savings to his customers. He's not allowed to tell them that I'll give you a little bit off if you use this card as opposed to this kind of American Express card. You can still use American Express card, just don't use this one that they make us do five or six percent on. But let's just talk about everyday people. Uh, you, you uh, in your testimony, um, talked about a cable company, uh, I think it was Time Warner, that added a modem, on, uh, or st not didn't add a modem, the modem was there, and suddenly, boom, $4, $3.95 is charged to every customer without any, just, they just add it. It's like a hidden fee. So that's what, you know, a hidden fee. We were talking about how this is going to save money now, I think the only way, the, the, the thing that saves money for corporations is uh, liability avoidance, which is what these clauses really uh, result in, complete and utter avoidance of liability. So, um, yeah, Time Warner, Comcast, Cox Cable, they can put in all sorts of hidden fees, and the consumer can't do anything about it because the amount that they're, o they're, they're being overcharged is just so small that it's, it's hardly worth, you know, staying on hold with customer service for half an hour, much less going into an individual arbitration to prove a claim that actually would be expensive to prove. 
So the only way these sorts of cases would ever get brought is in a class form. But to be honest, what I think your bill would do is it would actually return us to the status quo where corporations don't feel that they can engage in these widely dispersed small dollar harms because the class action uh, threat, the deterrent threat is out there. Um, and I, I think that's what your bill would do. And let's say there's actually a lot at stake in something. Uh, in, in, in 2011, I held a, a hearing on mandatory pre-dispute arbitration. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about getting rid of our, our arbitration. And I heard a testimony from a doctor in a gender discrimination uh, claim against her employer hospital. And the doctor showed, uh, the doctor was forced into arbitration and she told, in, she testified that how she showed up at the arbiter's office for the proceedings and saw shelves upon shelves of binders, with, she was the plaintiff, with the defendant's name on it. Clearly indicating that her arbiter, ar arbitrator, and the hospital had an ongoing business relationship. She, she lost the arbitration. And she left the proceeding feeling like she wasn't even really heard. She believed that the arbitrator was biased and didn't give her a fair shake. This whole thing really undermined her, her trust in the, in, in the system of justice. Now, Professor Rutledge, in, in, in 2004, before you started working for the Chamber of Commerce, you actually wrote a fairly compelling argument about this sort of thing. You wrote, quote, just as competition in the marketplace may provide some arbitrators independence, it may provide other arbitrators incentives to be beholding, beholden to particular parties or industries likely to nominate them, end quote. You wrote, you went on to say that arbitrators, arbitrators may, quote, develop reputations with particular types of parties. For an example, an arbitrator may per be perceived as in industry friendly. And you continued, quote, through these activities designed to enhance their reputations, arbitrators generate business in the form of fees and hopefully future appointments, end quote. So here's my, I'm curious, what would you say to that woman whose gender discrimination was forced case, was forced into arbitration, and she came out believing that the fix was in. Senator, thank you for your question. Let me first begin by saying, I don't know the details of the case that you're describing, so I'm going to give the best answer that I can. Sure. Based on your description. What would you say to her? I, 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 I have related to you in her testimony. What would you say to her? I understand. That's and the question. I what understand. What would you say to her? And, and, Senator, I think what I would say is that if you believed you were wrong and we can generate the evidence to demonstrate that you were wronged, we're going to find a way to get you relief. There are various ways in which that relief can be obtained. It can be obtained through litigation. No, no, well, if you have a I, mandatory pre-dispute arbitration clause in it, no, they can't. In fact, that's what this whole hearing is about. You just summed up the entire hearing. She can go to court. I understand, Senator. So why did you say she couldn't go to court? I, isn't that what this is all is about? I mean, isn't that what we're talking about? Senator. Isn't that what we've been doing for the last two and a half hours? I mean. Senator. <laughs> she can't go to court. May, may, may I answer the question? What would you say to the woman? We may go to litigation, that there are, that there are ways under current law whereby that arbitration clause can be challenged and we will attempt to see whether that clause can be challenged. If it can't be challenged, then we'll go to arbitration. And there are upsides to arbitration, some of which Mr. Parasharami has referred to. And so therefore, what I'm trying to say, Senator, and what I tried to say to Senator Lee as well, is that 
back to the point that, that you've made, and, and I agree with you, the apples to apples comparison is to try to discern which of these two systems is going to yield the better result for the aggrieved individual. Can I make, can I make uh, one other point just to... Well, after to, I, sure. I respond a little bit to Understand. I asked you what to say to a woman who brought a gender discrimination suit to an arbitrator. She went in. The arbitrator had the name of the hospital. She was a doctor. No woman had been promoted in that practice. <laughs> and she felt it was gender discrimination. She goes in. The guy in his office is folder after folder with the name of the hospital. She felt that the, the guy didn't hear her. I asked you what you'd say to her. The first thing you said to her, well, I go to court. You can go to court? Well, no, you can't go to court. Then the next thing you said, well, then we go to arbitration if we can't go to court. I told you she went to arbitration, and she felt that this guy, that the fix was in. And you yourself said, you yourself said in 2004 that arbitrators do this to get business. They develop reputations as friendly to industry. You said it. This is you. I read you back your own quote. What would you tell her? The fix is in, lady, ma'am. The fix is in. And that's not our system of justice. Go ahead. Sure. Senator, there, there, there are two points that I'm trying to make. Uh, one pertains to your question, and, and one pertains to the apples to apples point from a moment ago. What I'm trying to say as to this individual, and, and, and I, I, I apologize, Senator, if, if I misunderstood your question before. I had, I had understood your question to be what I would say to her at, at the front end of the dispute, and, and I take it your question now concerns. I asked you, what would you say to this sure. woman who testified here? I understand. That's what I asked you. I understand, Senator. And, and I can understand that from her perspective that that result would be disappointing. And what, I'm, and, and what I'm saying, Senator, is that there are instances in which the civil litigation system leaves people disappointed too. The second point that I just wish to make, Senator, because I'm, I'm very much with you on the apples to apples comparison point, and I don't know if you have a copy of the CFPB report with you or can see it. No. Um, to, 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 be, to, to, be very, to be very clear, Senator, what, if I could direct your attention to page 21 of the CFPB report. I'm there. This is the pie chart that you see. Mm -hmm. And what you see here in the sentence immediately below the pie chart, of the 393 credit card issuers, 67 issuers, or 17%, included arbitration clauses in their credit card contracts, while 326 issuers, or 83%, did not. That was the point that I was making about the low incidence of the use of arbitration clauses. And my and, and, question and, about apples sure, and, to apples and oranges right. to oranges was, <clears throat> what percent do those 17% have of the market? Absolutely. And, and, and to that, Senator, they have a large portion of the market. That's a what point. What percent that, would you say? Um, Don't you Senator, think that's relevant? In, I, I understand, Ms. Senator. Gillis, in, Professor in, Gillis, in, what percent of the market? Do Senator, they have? the answer is approximately 94 to 98 percent. 94 that is, to that is in a, 98 percent. That is in a 2011 okay, so, article that I published the point, that cited my testimony. Yeah, so you made the point in your testimony that we need to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And then you say that the CFPB report proves the point you've been trying to make today and uses your evidence that only 17% of credit card companies use these mandatory arbitration agreements without having the honesty, really, to say that apples to apples, Oranges to oranges, 94 to 98% of the market is that way. Now, some credit union credit card company is not going to 
you know, make, have any power over Mr. Carlson. That's the whole point of this. That's the whole point of this. And when you talk about empirical evidence and sound empirical evidence has to be done by objective people. It has to be done by objective people. That's what's sound empirical evidence. By the way, you write in your testimony, you can't, <coughs> you, 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 I, I think I've, I've said my piece on this. I, I just um, think that you, it, it, it is apples. I, I, w I want to give Mr. Carlson the last word on this. You felt it was important enough to come here today across the country. Uh, this is a big deal. Why is this issue so important to you? I think that's a terrific question. <clears throat> I wasn't doing this for money. I'm, I'm trying to do it just to level the playing field for all small business consumers so that they can uh, make a fair living. You know, I got into this business not I didn't get into the restaurant business to get rich. That's not the industry I think you throw yourself into to say, oh, wow, I'm going to work my ass off and make a fortune. Uh, you do put in a lot of long hours, but the, um, for me, the love and the passion comes from each guest that is satisfied that you put a smile on their face. That, that's why I do it, and that's why I came here. I'm, I'm just fighting for uh, everybody else to, to have the same opportunity that I've been blessed with, that I've... I have my own place, and it's not easy to, to, to do to try to find money to start start a business and and to uh, grow as a human. You know, you, you want to challenge yourself, and it's um, it's nice when people give you a hand out and, and and help a little bit. And that's that's all I'm trying to achieve here. So thank, thank you. you very much. For thank you. I like thank you. I would really like to thank all the witnesses for their testimony. I'd also like to submit letters and statements for the record from more than a dozen professors, advocates, and interested organizations. I was especially pleased to receive written testimony from Mike Rothman, Minnesota's Commerce Commissioner, who is working hard to enforce the law in my state. And I'd like to thank, um, uh, I'd like to thank him for his service to Minnesota. Uh, I think that the case for the Arbitration Fairness Act is pretty clear. I think we saw that when you come down to what this is. You can't go to court. With Concepcion and Italian colors on the books, the Federal Arbitration Act has become a tool that the big corporations can use to avoid their obligations under the laws. Mr. Carlin put it, we're basically at a point where big corporations can write their own rules. If we've heard today this has had a profound impact on, has had a profound impact, impact on consumers, workers, and small businesses. And simply put, it's just, it's not fair. It's not fair that powerful corporations can cheat consumers out of their hard-earned money, or that they can withhold wages or turn a blind eye to workforce or workplace discrimination, and that they can overcharge small businesses, that they can falsify affidavits foreclose on active duty service members who are overseas. That they can do all of this knowing all along that there's little, if anything, that the consumer or worker or small business or soldier can do to make it right for those who have been harmed. When I went to Walter Reed the first time, they ask you, I do a lot of USO tours, and they ask you to go to Walter Reed, and you think, how am I going to cheer up somebody who's lost some, the legs? First guy I met was from Anaconda. He lost two legs from a mortar. The Arbitration Fairness Act will restore access to justice for millions of Americans. I'd urge my colleagues to join me in that effort. We'll hold the record open for one week for submission of questions for the witnesses and other materials. The hearing is adjourned.